Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on organic quinoa production in the Pacific Northwest by Kevin Murphy of Washington State University. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topic on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore product. In this webinar, you'll learn about ongoing research on quinoa breeding, varietal selection, and agronomy at Washington State University. Our speaker, Kevin Murphy, is the barley and alternative crop breeder at Washington State University, and his crops of in interest include spring barley, quinoa, buckwheat, spelt, prozo millet, and hops. After his presentation, which will last about 45 minutes, we'll have an additional 30 minutes for questions from the audience. Great. Thanks, Alice. Um, this is Kevin Murphy, and um, welcome to the seminar, the webinar on organic quinoa breeding. Um, I Just to give you a little bit of a background, Muted. we've been breeding quinoa here and just working on quinoa for this, going into our fourth season, so we're pretty new at this. So if you have any questions near the end, we'll, you know, we'll answer them as best as we can, but really we're all in this quinoa learning process together. And at the bottom of this slide, you can see my contact information, um, my email down there. If you have any questions afterwards or later on, please don't hesitate to send me, send me an email and we'll respond as soon as we can. Okay. So I want to start by introducing two graduate students, Hannah Walters and Adam Peterson. You can see them in this picture here in front of some quinoa. Those are trees in the back, but right behind them is quinoa. And most of the research I will be discussing is research they're working on as part of their graduate studies. Um, Hannah is from Colorado State University, where she did some work on bean breeding for a few years, and now is working on an intercropping experiment as well as um, phenotyping research on multiple lines, which I'll discuss later on. Adam Peterson is from Washington State. He went to school at Evergreen State College, and he was actually one of the very first cooperators when he was an undergraduate at Evergreen State College on their organic farm. He ran our first quinoa trial um, on the west side. We also had them in Port Townsend and Pullman, and Adam ran the Olympia site. So I, I even have a couple pictures from back then I'll show later. Adam is um, finishing up his master's degree this spring and will move on to a PhD also in quinoa breeding starting in the fall. Okay, so just some of the topics I want to cover. You know, we could probably talk about quinoa for days, um, but we have 45 minutes, so I'll briefly talk about the origin and history of quinoa, some of the more interesting nutritional and agronomic characteristics. Um, variety selection is really important, so I'll talk about um, what varieties are out there, what options there are, and then about our plant breeding program as well. And then um, we'll go into a few slides on planting, growing, harvesting quinoa, and then really one of the hardest parts actually cleaning quinoa, cleaning and marketing of quinoa. And so then we'll just follow up with some questions. And there should be plenty of time, I think, for questions, so um, come, come ready, come ready with all of them. So the first question, what is quinoa? We'll just start start off with the basics here. Quinoa is um, genus species Quinopodium quinoa. It's a member of the Amaranthaceae family, and it's grown primarily for its seed. It's, it's also grown sometimes for its leaf, ed, its edible leaves. They are um, quite tasty. They taste a lot like lamb's quarter leaves, and they're very nutritious as well. But it's primarily grown for its seed. Um, Quinoa is a pseudo cereal or a pseudo grain. It's not a true grain. We all are somewhat in the habit of calling it a grain, but you know the the more correct term is a seed. Um, a, a true grain would be a cereal, more like wheat, barley, oats, rye. That's a monocot, so a, a grass. Quinoa is very closely related to beets, spinach, um, lamb's quarters as well, and and even tumbleweed. So one of the things you hear a lot about quinoa is its unique nutritional value, and and then foremost among nutritional value is the protein 
content, which can range depending on the environment it's grown in and the variety that's grown from 12 to 18 percent, um, which is on average with a lot of different seeds or grains. Um, but where quinoa really shines is that it contains high levels of 10 essential amino acids that our body needs. And then it also contains adequate levels of 10 other essential amino acids. So it's the only seed crop or really any plant crop that has this capacity to be a complete protein for the human body. It also has very high micronutrient concentrations and some macronutrient concentrations as well, including calcium, magnesium, iron, copper, and zinc. It's very rich in beta carotene, niacin, riboflavin, and a few of our uh, more common vitamins. And it is also high in essential fatty acids and in particular linoleic acid. Um, and there's a great, I have down here at the bottom of this slide, a really nice review article by Vega Galvez et al. that's really worth checking into on not just nutritional value of quinoa, but some agronomic aspects too. So the origin and history of quinoa is really fascinating and, and it plays a, a big role in how we grow quinoa in North America today. Um, the center of origin and the center of diversity is Lake Titicaca in Peru and Bolivia. Um, there is evidence of cultivation as early as 5000 BC. You can see Lake Titicaca on the map right in um, right right on the border between Bolivia and Peru and, and that's where it started about 5000 BC. From there it spread northwards to Colombia and it also spread southwards to um, central and, and central southern Chile. Mostly mostly it spread along the Inca Trail which was in, in wide use by then. Um, and then it was cultivated in Chile in about 750 BC. So it took a while to get there but that's important because um, the Chilean varieties that we've tested in in Washington state actually do much better than any of the varieties from Peru or Bolivia or Ecuador or even Colombia. So it's it's important to figure out where those um, varieties originated and and because our, our climate is much more similar to that of Chile those those lines tend to do quite a bit better for us. Um, so after the conquest of the Inca Empire uh, a lot of the road was destroyed um, so some some quinoa started to get isolated, grown in isolated pockets. It was reduced to areas that were harsh marginal environments um, and or isolated from the European influence. Um, and barley and wheat really started to take the place of quinoa. And so you can still see this in a lot of the countries down there today where barley and wheat are widely grown. Quinoa is making a bit of a comeback now. Um, and being grown on a larger scale. So in South America it's grown at a really wide range of latitudes from about 2 degrees north to 42 degrees south um, which is a range of over 3,000 miles. It has a wide range in altitude as well so from sea level up to over 13,000 feet. You hear some reports of it being grown over 14,000 feet as well. Um, it also has a wide range in annual rainfall. So it can be grown anywhere from below six inches of rainfall per year to over 110 inches of rainfall fall per year. So that's that's a huge difference. And a single variety doesn't do well in either of those rainfall zones or altitude zones or latitude ranges. So when you're looking at varieties, it's, it's important to pick ones that are more adapted to the area that you'll be growing in. And so back to this map, there are five major groups um, of Quinoa, the first one is the most important for us again. It's the sea level group. It's grown primarily in south central Chile up to about 42 degrees south latitude and usually less than 500 meters in elevation. The other four, the valley, subtropical, salar, and altiplano are also really important uh, but they, when they're translated to the environment we have up here they typically don't do as well. Our first year of variety trials we grew 44 different varieties and they were from all over South America and almost almost every single one from Peru or Bolivia did not set any seed up here in Washington State 
And then the ones that did do well were, again, from Chile. So just a quick overview of our Washington State University quinoa breeding and agronomy program. We have one overarching goal, but a lot of, lot of objectives. But the overarching goal is really to develop appropriate agronomic practices as well as specific quinoa varieties that are adapted to our Northwest environment and also to the wide range of farming systems up here. So we primarily are working on organic farms up to this point. Starting in 2013, we're also going to target some conventional growers and some no-till growers, some direct seeded growers. We have a, a lot of collabor collaborators working here at WSU, including um, sociologists, food scientists, extension, several soil scientists and entomologists, cereal chemist, um, agroecologist. So there's a lot of us working on this project um, in various forms and, and quite a few grad students as well. So even though we're just getting a start on this, we're hoping to really um, make some very quick and um, hopefully some pronounced progress in the next few years. Um, we're also working really closely with some researchers at, at Oregon State University, Utah State University, and Brigham Young University. And I'll talk a little bit more about them as we move up, move through this program. So one of the main reasons we started working with quinoa was growers started calling and asking about it, and you know nobody had done any research, and so we we really didn't have any answers for anybody. Um, Washington State does rank rank second behind California in the number of crops grown, and. So the growers up here are really, really excited about trying new crops and really good at trying new crops. And you know, the, they are amazing. So ranging from the wet, really diverse west side growers or vegetable growers, they want to include quinoa in rotations um, as just another value-added product, hopefully to break up disease cycles. And then you can see uh, this picture on the lower left here. This is a wheat field in the Palouse. And this is what a lot of Washington State looks like, just really big monocultures of wheat, um, followed oftentimes by barley or legumes. But these farmers, too, are also looking for ways to diversify their cropping rotation. And quinoa seems to be of interest to many of them, both organic and conventional growers. So some of the more interesting agronomic characteristics, I'll just touch on a couple of the highlights. Quinoa is known to be very drought tolerant. A lot of that goes back to the, the map I showed you and um, what region of Bolivia or Peru they're from. But a lot of those areas don't get much rainfall. We did have a Peruvian quinoa breeder visiting us last summer, and she works at a research station called La Molina in near, near Lima in Peru. And she said somewhere close to them, it hadn't rained since about 19, I think, 79, she said. So that's really, really dry. But that's the type of environment, not quite that extreme, but that's the type of environment that quinoa evolved in and comes from. And so that's really one of the main reasons quinoa is so drought tolerant. It's also somewhat susceptible to heat. And if you're growing, hoping to grow quinoa in your environment, if it's over 95 degrees, especially during um, key times, like for example, pollen formation, it can lead to, to sterility, pollen sterility, and lead to quinoa, essentially sterile quinoa heads. You won't get any, any grain. So if it's above 95, you're going to start running into those kind of problems. We always hover around that here in Pullman, and, and some varieties are more susceptible to heat than other varieties. Um, if you well, what so that's one of the things we're actually selecting for right now. Adam's going to be working on that in his PhD. Is how can we, how can we start to develop really heat tolerant quinoa varieties? And one of the ways, non-genetic ways, is to grow it with some supplemental irrigation. So there's there's an interaction between heat and and irrigation. And so the hotter it is, if you do add some irrigation to that, that helps alleviate the heat issues. Quinoa also grows really well in high, highly saline soils. You can see a couple of photos here of Colorado and Bangladesh and, and Washington. We see this somewhat as well. Um, and throughout the world, there's 350 hectares that are considered highly saline. 
North America, it's not a huge problem, just about 6 million hectares, but 6 million hectares is still, is still significant. Most of these are in Asia, almost, almost about half of the world's hectares that are saline um, are in Asia. And here, so this shows a picture of wheat growing in, I'll explain it in a, the next slide, but eight decisiemens of, um, which is fairly, fairly high saline soil. And this is, this is in Mexico. And so if this was um, your, your wheat field, you'd be really disappointed with your yields. There's a lot of dead spots, bare spots out there. If quinoa was growing in this field, however, it would most likely not show any effects um, from this, the salinity issues in this field. So quinoa is a halophyte, which means it's capable of tolerating higher soil salinity while maintaining high yields. Um, a saline soil is typically defined as having more than being more than four decisiemens per meter. Uh, decisiemens per meter is a measurement of electrical conductivity in the soil. And so anything more than four is, is considered saline soils. Quinoa, uh, on the other hand, it can grow well and still maintain high yields up to 20 decisiemens per meter. Barley is a, only goes up to about six or eight, and same with wheat, just a little bit less, maybe about six. Uh, so, so quinoa does very well in, in saline soils. It when you get above 20 decisiemens per meter, it's, it still has good yields, but only about 60% of normal. So just as a point of reference to seawater is about 55 decisiemens per meter. So here's a small collection of available seed varieties. And again, it's really, really important to choose the right variety of seed if you're planning on growing quinoa. We have heard reports of a, a couple growers buying seed from the local co-op or um, distributor or even um, you know Walmart or Costco, places like that, and then planting them. And, and if you do that, you're usually growing seed that's been grown in Bolivia or Ecuador, which, which grows really well there, but when you try and grow it up here, it doesn't do so well. Oftentimes, they'll, they won't germinate very well, and they might get seven or eight feet tall before they even start flowering and, and never start even making seed before the fall comes. So it is really important to get a, a, good, a good source of seed and even though it's a little more expensive or sometimes a lot more expensive, it's really well worth it. So here's, here's a list of some seeds. We haven't tried all of these, but we've tried some of them and I'll be discussing a few of them. The, the ones that work really well for us are some of the seeds from Wild Garden Seeds in Philomath, Oregon. Frank Morton, they're not even all on here. He has another one, a new one out, but Frank Morton's been breeding quinoa for several years and does an excellent job with, um, with his selections. And you can see there's also some here from California, Missouri, Canada, Colorado. So there's, there's definitely some worth taking a look at. And if, if you're going to try them, I'd go ahead and recommend trying as many as you can and just see which ones do the best and then focus on those. And these are all different seed colors. Most of these are white, but there's also red, um, black, and then different shades of yellow, gold, and brown. So here's a picture. Uh, this is a picture of Hannah's research. This is one of the populations we were given from Brigham Young University. Jeff Mon and Rick Jellen have been working on quinoa genetics for about 15 years there. and We really um, were very fortunate to meet up with them and, and they were very generous in sharing their seed with us. And So Hannah was working on four different populations for a total of 350 different lines this past year and looking at them for all different types of traits. But this picture really shows the diversity. So if you can see my my mouse here, it's circling one of the different lines that that was very short. And we were really excited about this to begin with, but um, it ended up not doing too much. But still, this just illustrates the diversity because if you look at the line next to it, this big tall one, this grew seven or eight feet tall. Um, and also, it, it, I mean, essentially it was too tall, but so within this is, and this is within the same 
from the progeny of the same cross. And, and out of those 350 lines from the four populations, I think we only selected about 15 or 18 of those to move on to our next to the next round of selection, which will be our multi-state organic variety trials. I'll talk more about those in a minute as well. And then this was about 350 lines. We'll be looking at another maybe 400 lines, so a total of 700 to 800 lines next year. So really, really bumping this up and getting a good look at all the different possibilities. And the end goal with this is to be able to start releasing varieties that that are unique in many different characteristics and do well in our environment. So this is a picture here of Tinker Cavallero along with Adam Peterson. She was one of the first uh, people we collaborated with to grow quinoa trials, again on a very small scale. And she's based in Port Townsend, Washington. And when we looked at these, there are many different traits of interest. One of the key ones, though, is maturity. So what, what we want is quinoa varieties that mature early enough so that by the time the fall, cold or fall rains come, we already have the quinoa out of, this, out of the field. And that's, that's not as easy as it sounds. There are so many quinoa varieties that just keep growing and growing. So really selecting an early maturing quinoa variety is important for us. We also are looking at seed, seed size and color. There, there um, is a good opportunity to start releasing some good varieties that are, are red or gold or just different interesting colors. And lodging resistance. So lodging is when a plant falls over. We do want to select plants that can stand up to 40 mile an hour winds or, or excessive rainfall or excessive nitrogen in the soil and do really well. And a lot of these taller varieties don't do that. So lodging resistance, it, although in general, you know, if wheat grew as tall as quinoa, it would be it would be flat on the ground. So quinoa d overall is pretty has a pretty stiff stalk, stiff stem, um, but there are some lines that are really good at, at lodging resistance, and they, these are typically the shorter ones. I mentioned salinity tolerance. We are going to continue to work with that. Adam's been doing research in the greenhouse. But Utah State, with Jennifer Reeve and Earl Creech, will be also working on some salinity tolerance sites or selection on their highly saline sites in Utah. And so there'll be a lot more information over that on that over the next few years. I mentioned drought tolerance. That that's really important to us. There's a couple million acres of dry land grain production in the Northwest, at least that much. And, and we want to be able to select quinoa for uh, drought tolerance as well. I'll discuss ligus and aphid resistance, insect resistance in a few slides. We're also selecting for nitrogen use efficiency. Um, and then I'll, also, I'll mention saponin content at the end of this talk. So sprouting resistance, if you've heard of that, it's, it's an issue with rains that come usually in August or September near harvest. So here's a picture of one way to deal with sprouting problems or rain, fall rain, late summer, early fall rains. And this is panicle architecture. And so quinoa is very, very diverse in its um, panicle architecture and its general morphology. And so on the left you can see there's a quinoa variety that's more highly branched and it allows a lot more air to flow through and, and this really does help in drying out the seed. If you compare that to the seed, uh, the plants on the right, those are really dense, big seed heads just packed full of seeds. But the problem with those is if it does get wet, it starts to mold, and then it can the, the um, seeds will actually start to sprout in the head. So here's a picture Adam took in Olympia uh, where you can see really well the actual seeds sprouting in the head of the quinoa plant. And this in general is considered to be a bad thing. If um, I th this was this was due to several inches of rain in August, but the interesting thing with this is there were varieties of quinoa right next to this one, so they experienced the same rainfall, but that didn't sprout at all. So that also tells us, like similar to wheat and barley, quinoa does have some genetic resistance to pre-harvest sprouting. So that's something we are selecting for which could be very important to growers in 
Western Oregon, Western Washington, or anywhere in the eastern U.S. where where late summer rains are more common. So yield trials. To date, our our trials have been very small scale, and so instead of extrapolating them to yield per acre, we typically just compare the varieties to one to one to another, and the one that's done very well for us over the last couple, three years is Colorado 407D. It's also known as Dave 407 after one of the um, early U.S. quinoa pioneers. Uh, it's, it's available. I didn't mention adaptive seeds in the previous slide when I talked about seed companies or varieties, but this Dave 407 is available this year from adaptive seeds, so that's great. And that one's done really well for us. Also, any of the varieties from wild garden seeds have typically done quite well too. In particular, cherry vanilla, redhead, even brightest brilliant rainbow, which is a bit taller. All these have done done really well, um, and those are from Frank Morton. Again, he's in Philomath, Oregon. So both of those you are easily available to anybody who's interested. There are a couple other varieties though that have done extremely well here as well, but are very difficult to find in in any type of commercial quantity. These are Puno and Caslea. And our hope is to be able to grow enough of this seed over the next year or two that we can offer it to a seed company and then they can start selling it so it can be available to anybody who's interested. But for whatever reason, those did really well here. And then just speaking of yield in general, there's a White Mountain Farm in Colorado and got a, a recent email from, um, from John McCammon there who said 2012 they they grew a little bit over 100 acres of quinoa they grow both a black and a white variety and they mentioned he or they, uh, John mentioned that the yield in 2012 was about was about a thousand pounds an acre so that's just something to put in your head thousand pounds an acre maybe maybe what that you would get in Colorado or or anywhere right now, so that's that's kind of a benchmark, something we're shooting for doing here as well, and um, hopefully getting higher yields in the future too. In 2013, um, and then for the next years, we'll be conducting larger scale organic variety trials. These will be conducted on farm, on organic farms, two in Washington, two in Oregon, and two in Utah. We're also hoping, as I mentioned before, to grow some conventional variety trials as well as some no-till variety trials. So for Washington State, I wanted to show you our main locations for testing. This first one is in the Palouse area, and this is where Pullman is, where we do a lot of our testing, where Washington State University is headquartered. And so we've got an organic farm here, a really great one, and we've done a lot of testing there for several years. Um, and this is also where, we're hope where we are going to be doing some of our larger scale variety trials and agronomic trials next year on organic, no-till, and conventional soils. The, uh, the main farming system here is winter wheat followed by either spring wheat or spring barley followed by legumes. And so we're trying to, again, to see if we can get quinoa to fit in the rotation somehow there. It's all dry land here, almost entirely dry land here. So that's one of our main goals. A second major site, and this circle should be bigger, but where we'll be growing in variety trials over the next few years is the Northeast Olympic Peninsula. And this is a great area because it covers relatively low rainfall zones up to relatively higher rainfall zones within a small distance. And there's some great farmers in this area who are going to be working with as well to grow these variety trials and and it gives a, us a whole different um, types of selection pressures to choose from. And then finally, speaking of selection pressures, we have the Lower Columbia Basin and we're going to be starting to grow quinoa there as well. And, and what will be great about this site is it will be a great place to really test quinoa varieties and breeding lines for heat tolerance. And if they can survive the typically 100 degree weather here in in this Prosser Lower Columbia Basin area should do quite well elsewhere as well in other heat sensitive environments. We'll also be conducting um, irrigation and, and fertility trials there.
So I'll talk now a little bit about actually growing quinoa. It can be planted in a many number of ways, either broadcast seeded or um, seeded with one of these little push seeders. We've seeded by hand before, and we've also seeded with a tractor a pull behind seeder. And all of those work really well. Quinoa is mildly frost tolerant, down to about 28, 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can you can get it in the soil a little bit earlier than some less like earlier than corn, or earlier than buckwheat. But it's not an overwintering crop, at least not up here. So it's a spring planted crop. It germinates well though in relatively cold soil. So even at 45 degrees Fahrenheit, it can germinate. It does germinate better and as the soil warms up, but it but it, the, the low soil temperature will not kill the seed. So planting date really depends on the local climate, potential for hard frost, what the, how soon you can get into your soil. And our collaborators at Oregon State University, Steve Petrie and Stephen Machado, are going to be looking at planting date very closely over the next few years and, and also seeding rate and, and a lot of these issues. And they're going to start by looking at really planting from March through June and seeing which is the optimal optimal planting date. We have planted as late as June 25th here in Pullman. Um, I wouldn't recommend that, but we did we did end up with a nice nice quinoa crop that year and partly that was due to a, a very dry fall that we had so the, the quinoa crop wasn't rained on but typically you want to get it in before June. So some of the guidelines, this is a picture of one of Adam Peterson's earlier plots, I think from two years ago. You can see the, uh, the spacing. We, we have larger spacing between, um, between plots, but within plots you can kind of see the spacing here. And this is something we don't have a really good handle on, but we typically go about one gram being used for 12 to 20 row feet. There's about 350 seeds per gram that does change with variety, but that's a rule of thumb. And we do have a local grower who figured out how much seed should be grown per acre, and so he's going to be trying about seven pounds per acre this year, and so we'll know a lot more, see how that does um, in in our environment. But really, it does depend a lot. Your roast depends a lot on the rainfall zone, and you also want it to fit in with whatever system you're already using on your farm. So if you're set up with cultivators to cultivate 15 inches, you know, it should work just fine at 15 inches. It should work 12 inches, should work at 20 inches. really depends on, on what your farming system is like. This is a quick picture. We're transitioning just for a slide from Washington to Malawi. We, we were asked by a Malawian app reader to set up some variety trials with him there. His name is Moses Malero. He'll be out next summer as well. But these are some of the different varieties and, and row spacing that he tried last year. And overall got very, very good results in Malawi. So again, I mentioned this earlier, but this is um, one of the primary forms of cultivation on small scale farms using a, a farm all, or this is a Alice Chalmers Model G tractor and doing some some belly cultivation. So any type of cultivation, any type of sweeps or shovels that you can put under this, usually the row spacing will work great. Weeds are really a major issue with quinoa and one of the worst ones is lamb's quarter because it looks so similar to quinoa early on. And if you do plant in straight rows, one of the benefits of doing that is you can take out a lot of the weeds, especially the similar looking lamb's quarter weeds just by using one of these machines or, or even hose, anything like that. So irrigation. Irrigation can increase yield, but it also does increase lodging and the potential for disease. Disease primarily if overhead irrigation is used. Here's a, a picture of Hannah's trials last year using drip irrigation. Now, if you look closely at the picture, you can see about two-thirds of the field has drip irrigation and the final third has um, no irrigation. So the first third of the field has um, irrigation was irrigated every week whether it needed it or not once a week. The second third of the field was irrigated every two weeks 
and the third part of the field was only irrigated once, and that was right after seeding to get the uh, the plants up. And this was plant this was the trial planted June 25th, so the results are a bit skewed because of the late planting. Um, but I'll show those results here in just a minute. One other thing to note, though, on this picture is you can see some other crops growing in. So we did try, this is an intercropping trial here as well. So you can see, like up here, this is um, some clover intercropped with the quinoa. Down here, this looks like clover and fescue intercropped with the quinoa. And then there's some plots like right here where there was no intercrop. Okay, so here's, um, just focus on the, uh, the circled area for this graph. But this is the effect irrigation can have on seed yield. Um, and this is from the trial I just showed you. So there was a full irrigation and a part irrigation treatment. And both of those had the highest seed yield um, across varieties, across cover crops. They did very well. The, the no irrigation treatment had extremely low seed yields. And we normally wouldn't expect this big a difference. I'd be surprised if we see this next year. Again, I think this is really due to the fact of, of the late planting and the lack of soil mo moisture involved with that planting as late as June 25th. But still, irrigation does does play a huge role. And then there also is the potential for quinoa um, if we can get maturity uh, maturity level maturity short enough. Then you know getting quinoa planted in late June might not be all that all that odd a type of rotation. It, it, you see it quite a bit here with other crops such as buckwheat following weed in the irrigated parts of Washington State. and So maybe quinoa would fit in in that way as well. So irrigation does help. Um, one thing we noticed in those those irrigated plots though the plants did get quite a bit higher and did by the time we started to harvest them had started to lodge um, some some fairly considerably. So moving on to fertility, quinoa traditionally has been known as growing very well in marginal soils and it's also been known as a, a nutrient scavenger. It often traditionally would follow potatoes in the Andean rotation systems. So we get the question a lot about how much nitrogen or fertilizer to put on quinoa, and we really don't have a, any solid answers for you. We've we've heard reports anywhere from below 40 pounds an acre to well over 200 pounds an acre um, being optimal for quinoa production. We have looked at this in some of Adam's trials earlier on, and we didn't see much of a yield benefit from putting any more than 40 pounds per of nitrogen per acre, um, but that was used. We did do that trial on a fairly high fertility organic farm here in Pullman. So so that's something we're hoping to find out, out pretty soon exactly how much. And that also depends on what variety you're using, how tall it is, and all these other, uh, other options with that. Um, but one thing, we were also looking at the intercropping trial to test for soil fertility and see if this helped increase the the seed yield of quinoa. And I'll show that in the next slide, but first again I just wanted to point out there were some treatments with clover, some not shown here with clover and, and fescue, and then a control treatment here with neither. So now again just focusing on the circled in area, um, that first bar graph, it looks like control is partially um, deleted, but that first bar graph, the orange one, does say control. So that's the one with no intercrop. And that did much better than the one with a clover mix. And we're not quite sure why, um, but it might have something to do with the interpacific competition between quinoa and clover. The fescue clover mix was somewhere intermediate. You looked a little bit better than the clover mix, a little less than the control. But this is something we're going to be doing a lot more exploring over the next few years, how we can best intercrop quinoa, and and not just for seed yield within that year, but also to suppress weeds. And if you look in this this picture, this shows the winter survival. This is the quinoa field that I just showed you, but this is the winter survival of the 
of the um, inter crops. And so winter's not over yet, so these might not end up surviving. But right here, in this first area, this is this looks to me like it could be the clover treatment or the clover fescue treatment. It's a little hard to tell from this picture, but you can see there's some treatment still surviving quite well. And so that's something we want to do as well, like use clover or medic. We're going to try medic next year as a nurse crop within the quinoa um, to help to help supplement fertility, to help suppress weeds, but then also after the quinoa is harvested, this clover and medic or whatever we end up growing should really take off in the spring, provide a lot of biomass. It should also provide some winter cover for the soil so it doesn't wash away soil. Erosion is a big problem out here in, in the Palouse. Um, so we'll, We'll be testing for biomass in the spring on all these different treatments, and we'll also be testing for the effects of these intercrops on improving soil fertility, which can then improve the rotational crop following quinoa. Okay, so common pests and diseases. If you know what this disease is, clap your hands. Okay, good. We. <laughs> I, I didn't hear anybody. I, I'm not sure I could, but I, I did hear Adam and Hannah in the back. So this one here is downy mildew, and it's the number one disease of quinoa worldwide. It, it prefers cool, moist climates, and even though we're not quite cool and moist out here in Pullman, we still see downy mildew. I showed you the symptoms. It's irregularly shaped areas of pink um, or chlorotic or necrotic discoloration that's often accompanied by gray sporulation on the leaves. And it the problem is it reduces the photosynthetic capacity of the plant as a whole. And so severe downy mildews can cause complete yield loss or almost complete yield loss in a plant. So it, it's something we need to figure out. And, and one of the ways to control downy mildew is through resistance, genetic resistance. If you compare this plant to the previous plant. This one also was infected by downy mildew, but it stopped, the plant actually stopped the downy mildew from spreading. And this is common with a lot of fungal diseases, this type of resistant, where it's okay to see a little bit of downy mildew on the plant. As long as it doesn't spread, you're okay. So resistant varieties are one way to control downy mildew. And, and the most resistant varieties we've seen Bar. And, and again, we haven't been looking too long, but usually the the varieties from Frank Morton at Wild Garden Seeds do really well with this. And I think partly because Frank's been breeding them in a cool, moist climate, uh, Philomath, Oregon. So so he's been selecting for downy mildew resistance, I would guess, um, throughout the years. But another way to control downy mildew is to surface sterilize the seeds. And you can do this one of two ways. Either use a quick ble bleach rinse or use about 70% ethanol for two minutes. You don't want to go much more than two minutes. You just soak the seeds real quick and then make sure they're dry. And that should kill the uh, downy mildew. OK, so this is one of the major insect pests that we see. This is a ligus bug. And if you see it right here in the middle, it is fairly easy to identify at this stage because of the heart-shaped or sometimes triangle-shaped yellow spot on its back. Ligus, as a species, <clears throat> as a genus, excuse me, f feeds on many different crops. So, and quinoa happens to be one of them. It it typically feeds on the immature developing quinoa seeds. And so what happens is you can have a really nice, beautiful looking panicle, and it can be completely devoid of seeds if the if the ligus has completely infested the plant. Um, and these can it can also like downy mildew result in total seed loss. Another issue with quinoa to keep keep a lookout for is aphids, and aphids seem to be more of a hit or miss type. Crop. We don't usually see them on every plant. We just they seem to attack the weaker, excuse me, the weaker plants, and and focus on those and really decimate those. So we're, we are looking for aphid resistance. I'm not sure how successful we will be with um, finding any of that, but but regardless, we're going to try. 
to look for aphid resistant plants. Um, but another way to control both ligus and aphid, which has seemed to work fairly well for us, is through biological control. And the main place we grow quinoa here in Pullman is on the WSU organic farm, which grows a great diversity of crops. And, and because it does this, it also has a large diversity of beneficial insects. And so I just mentioned some here. I won't, I won't dwell on this too much. Um, but wasps of the genus Peristinus and then also Anaphis, both are parasitoids of ligus bugs. They, they work really well. There, it's also been reported on other crops that big-eyed bugs, damsel bugs, assassin bugs, crab spiders, and some others are also excellent um, predators for either aphids and, lig and or ligus. So we do have an entomologist, as I mentioned before, David Crowder, who will be focusing on this over the next few years, and we'll see we'll see what you know if we can come up with some recommendations for getting rid of these rid of these insects, at least keeping them in check. So once once you're getting close to harvest, you want to test for seed maturity. And so what Adam's doing here, he's wearing his lucky uh, clover intercropping hat. But what he's doing here is testing the seeds for maturity using well, I'm not sure, but one way to test is the fingernail test, and you can push your fingernail into the seed, and if it makes a dent, that means it's either very close, or if it's about to rain, you can go ahead and harvest that. But what you want is when you put your fingernail into the seed, you want there to be no dent, and then you know it's ready to harvest. Okay, so now we're at the harvest stage, and this is really, you know, growing quinoa, Getting the seed, the right variety, planting, growing is, is really the easy part of quinoa. If you're, if you're considering growing quinoa, you really have to think this stage through very well because um, it, it can be different from what you're used to, whether you're a grain grower or a, or a vegetable grower. It's, it's, a, it's a different crop. Um, and so what you see here is some cooperators, Dharma Ridge Farm in Chimicum, Washington, cut Bunch of, a bunch of quinoa stalks just using lettuce knives here and then tied them into bundles. Then we started, um, we brought over our thresher and we started threshing each bundle one by one. This is uh, what's called a Vogel thresher. It was developed at WSU by an old wheat breeder named Orville Vogel over 60 years ago and it still works really well today. And so what we do is push the, uh, push the bundles through the Vogel thresher Zach here is handing the bundles up to Hannah. She's pushing them through. In here, there's a drum, a rotating drum, with a lot of metal fingers that essentially just rip the seeds off the stalks. Hannah will pull the stalks back out, toss it into the back of the truck. And Adam down here is catching all the seed as it comes through. Um, these Vogel threshers are still custom manufactured. You can see here on the front, they're by Bill's Welding in Pullman, Washington. So they're still available, but you have to, they, they make them um, specific to orders. So this is a picture I took in Pakistan last year, and it's very similar to what we do, what, what I just showed you, but they cut the, the quinoa again, and then just instead of bundling it, they put it into um, piles and let, just let the piles dry for a day or two. Then they move the piles to these cloths, and instead of using a thresher, they used a stick. And it's it's very dry in, in Pakistan at this time of year, so just beating those heads with a stick worked really well, and all the seeds collected into that cloth, and then they could start winnowing the, the seed. And I'll show that picture in a minute, but this just brings to mind that that's really important to have dry plant matter. Um, and dry seed when you're at the harvest stage. If not, you'll get something that looks like this, which is, this has just been using a Vogel thresher, but the, this variety this year, these, these plants were pretty wet. And so this was our thresh seed, and as you can see, you can't really see a whole lot of seed in here. So it is important to have it dry however you can do that. Um, once it does dry on a tarp, the seeds start to pop out, or you can start beating them with a stick as well. And um, the seeds, they do a lot, they start to pop out really quickly once everything's dried down. And this is what it starts to look like after a while. 
So this is this is what you want to start the seed cleaning process with. And I won't talk too much about seed cleaning at this point in the talk. If you have questions, please do let us know. But there are a lot of different options for seed cleaning. We're still trying to figure out the best for our scale and our size. Um, but quinoa is a fairly light and small seed. And so it's it's something that if you are planning on growing quinoa, you do want to make sure you have a good way to clean the seed ahead of time. You don't want to wait too late for this because, again, you, you want to do it while it's dry, if at all possible. So this, back to Pakistan, this is how they clean, this is how they clean their seed, and it, it's amazing how well it does. I, you know, their seed looked cleaner than ours after we ran ours through various machines, and what they did was just use a winnower several times and, and allow the, the wind to blow the chaff away from the seed and the seed drops and they did this, they repeated this a few times and by the end the seed looked really nice and clean. But again they started with very, very dry seed so that helps. This is a picture of what they were, that woman was holding up, what they used to uh, winnow the seed. It looks pretty homemade and um, I th so that just shows you can really be innovative and come up with some something that should work to clean the seed in the scale. This is Janet Gihan. She is our number one combine driver in our program. Um, she's driving what we call a winter stagger plot combine. So you can also harvest quinoa with a combine. It works really well. Um, you do have to modify it for these smaller, lighter seeds. The first time we tried this, we ended up blowing a lot of seed out the back. So, so it's worth worth investing some time in if you do have a combine to get the right sieves, the right shaker sizes, um, figure out the right airspeed, concave, etc. to get all those working right before you start with quinoa. We use this combine primarily for barley and wheat so it, it does um, take some adjusting to get it to work for quinoa but once you do it, it does tend to work pretty well. If you're planning on saving seed, here are just some basics of quinoa. And I'm not talking about seed for eating or selling to the market, but seed for saving and regrowing. Quinoa is predominantly a self-pollinated crop. It does, it, on average, have a reported about 10% outcrossing rate. Um, but typically it's self-pollinating. And it doesn't cross much over 300 feet. It's, it's very rare, over 100 meters for any cross-pollination to occur. So if you do grow quinoa, you want a minimum of 300 feet isolation dif distance between varieties. Population size really depends on what variety you're using. I put 50, over 50 plants for pure line varieties, um, but really there are very few pure line varieties out there. We, I actually haven't really seen any yet. So most of the Quinoa varieties are very diverse, would be more considered land races, and, and that's actually a good thing. But because of this, you want to grow a lot more plants if possible at 500 or so, and that way you can really get a good sense of what the variety looks like, and if there are any off types you don't want in there, you can take them out without losing much seed. The main concern, the main problem is cross-pollination with lambs quarters. Um, they are the same genus though different species, but they can cross-pollinate, so if you are growing quinoa for seed, you want to make sure there's no lambs quarters anywhere in the area. And then saponins. Many of you have probably heard about saponins. This is something we don't have a lot of experience with because we always regrow our seed to plant. Again, we don't eat it. Um, as, as barley or, or wheat breeding, you know, you get in the habit of tasting seeds as you walk out in the field. When you try that with quinoa, though, you you quickly discourage because it does taste so bitter and and that bitterness is due to the saponins. Um, the saponins are really have this bitter, soapy, unpalatable taste to them. It, it's, it's very unpleasant and they have to be removed. But one of the benefits that has been reported for saponin um, on the seed is that it is a bird deterrent. Bird, it apparently doesn't taste good to birds either. We, we really haven't seen this but there's quite a few reports about this so we think we think it might be beneficial to keeping birds away. Um, so how, how do you remove them? This is, again, not, not from our direct experience, but, but from talking to a lot of people about this, there's two main ways to remove them. One is mechanically and the other is through washing. 
Here's a picture of a rice dehuller that's used um, in in the Andes as as for getting rid of the saponins. Um, it uses a process similar to that of purling the barley, dehulling rice, um, and it's quite an abrasive process. There's also people who've used ro um, rotating brushes to get rid of saponins. Uh, I think there's a lot of different possibilities for this. And then as far as washing and rinsing, again, again you have to be innovative, kind of work on what you have to work with. Um, what size scale you are, etc. Here's an interesting one I I found on islandgrains.com. Um, they call it the the washing machine method. And what you do is you run your washing machine through a cycle with just vinegar. Um, and what this does is clean out any soap residue because again you're trying to get rid of the soap. Um, you put the quinoa in a pillowcase and tie it shut. And then using just water, run it through the washing machine two or three times. When, when I started eating quinoa 20 years ago, oftentimes it didn't come with the saponin removed. You had to remove it. And typically what we did was just in the sink, rinse it really well. Um, so that's, that's what they're doing here. Marketing, there's a lot of different potential ways to market. I mean, the number one w way it's still eaten is just as a whole grain. But there's also ways to market it as a whole grain for quinoa bread or mixed with wheat. A uh, lot of gluten-free products out there now. There's some alcoholic products being made. There's beer. There's even a new vodka, quinoa vodka, out there. Um, and then the, it seems like there's a really good potential for it being included in cereals and grain mixtures as well. And then some of the growers we work with are starting to test out different markets. So farmers market CSAs are two, two other options, packaging it in smaller quantities. Working with bakers, local bakers as well, to give them quinoa seed or quinoa flour. And then the wholesale, if you're going to be a little bit larger scale, here are a few names of some wholesalers who have been interested, but actually there's quite a few. This is just a few names, but Hummingbird Wholesale in Eugene, Oregon, Whole Foods, Northwest, but throughout the country, they're interested. Earthbound Farm, there's a lot of potential markets for domestic quinoa. So I'm going to Get it, we're getting near the end of this webinar, and I wanted to show a couple more pictures of Adam and Hannah. And, and the one of Hannah is interesting because that's um, Luz Gomez on the left, and she is the Peruvian quinoa breeder I mentioned earlier. She did come last year to see our fields, and she'll be coming again this year. And, and she'll be coming for a symposium we'll be hosting in Pullman. It, it's the International Quinoa Research Symposium. We're, we're coinciding this with the UN United Nations uh, International Year of Quinoa 2013. And we've invited speakers. These speakers have all accepted from Chile, Argentina, Peru, Bolivia, Denmark, Malawi, Pakistan, and then several domestic speakers as well, farmers, seed growers. And it, it should be a really fun symposium. We're, we're going to focus on research, but there'll be a lot of farmer presentations. There'll be some marketing presentations as well. Dr. Sven Eric Jacobson from the University of Copenhagen in Denmark will be our keynote speaker. It's August 12th through 14th. And I included a flyer in here just so you could see um, some of what we've got going for what we've got planned for the research symposium. We're developing a website right now. Hopefully it'll be ready by the end of sometime in March anyway. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge our funders, the Organic Farming Research Foundation started funding us about four years ago and really provided the seed money for this whole project. And I, without them, we might not have gotten started at all. Cliff Bar Family Foundation, Seed Matters, they fund Hannah Walters. They've been very generous with a few organic plant breeding fellowships across the country. We do have one of those, and so Hannah's working on organic plant breeding thanks to Cliff Bar. The WSU Center for Sustaining Agriculture and Natural Resources has also, for the last few years, been very supportive of this quinoa project. And all these allowed us to get a larger USDA Organic Research and Extension in this Initiative grant, which, which really allows us to work with growers outside of Washington State and, and researchers outside of Washington State as well. And what we want to do is make this not just apl applicable to the Northwest or even Western US, but we want to develop 
varieties and cropping systems and collaborations with researchers across across the US North America and, and beyond that as well so that's the end of the webinar if there are any questions so um, moving on um, we have several questions about the potential for growing quinoa in the Northeast so if you could talk about that and some of the challenges Northeastern growers might face um, oh, uh, hi uh, this is uh, Adam Peterson I'm uh, one of Kevin's grad students um, a couple things or well, one major thing comes to mind for the Northeast and that's I know there are a lot of humid summers uh, in the eastern United States and an issue with that might be uh, powdery mildew. Um, there were some recent reports of, of quinoa trials in Pennsylvania where they started to see powdery mildew issues. Um, so that, that would be one thing that I think of. Another would be, um, I know rain falls uh, more spread evenly throughout the year. Um, in the western United States we have dry summers but um, if you were to have a rain event um, and you know, as, as the seed had matured, you, you might have some issues with sprouting in the heads. Um, those are just two that come to mind. Um, of any event. Yeah, th this is Kevin again. We did get a report from Elizabeth Dick up in New York who grew some quinoa, I think organic quinoa as well this past year. And I, I think her main concern was that it got a little too hot there. And I think it was just a very hot summer in general. But the heat seemed to have an, a negative effect on quinoa, and and the 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 traits Adam mentioned as well as heat tolerance, there there's something we can overcome. And what we've seen here with heat tolerance is because quinoa varieties are typically so diverse, we may get lower yields the first year, but everything we harvest from those yields will be at least as heat tolerant as that summer selection pressure provided us. And so. As, as each season goes by, if you're continuing to select your seed in these hotter and hotter environments or, or just hotter than quinoa is used to, your seed should uh, to some point respond to that and be able to um, withstand hotter temperatures. And we've seen this in, in, our, in some of our lines here um, and it's worked quite well. So I would, I would encourage anybody in the Northeast to at least give it a try. Again, try as many varieties as you can. Um, but I'm guessing the farming system up there would be different than what we have here. But, but again, also as, as we get more and more information from our larger scale variety trials, we'll put those up on the website. Well, the website doesn't exist yet, but we'll have a website. We'll put those up on the website, um, probably through eOrganic as well, and get all that information out to everybody who's interested and hopefully there's some overlapping between some of the lines that do well here and some of the lines that will do well in the Northeast. Yeah, we had a question about whether some of the cultivars from Chile uh, might do well in the Northeast. Um, I, I know the climate in Chile, is, uh, as far as rainfall distribution and temperatures, is actually quite similar to the Western United States. So, for instance, um, they have a dry period in their summer, um, higher temperatures in their summer, and, and rains in the spring. And, Fall. That, that's inverted because they're in the, the southern hemisphere, so it takes place opposite of us. But um, in general, I think that the Chilean varieties would probably be more adapted to, say, uh, Washington, Oregon, and California, um, where you have a dry period in the summer. Um, but like I said, you know, th those t those types are, are the most uh, adapted to temperate locations. So I would think that you know those varieties would do best in any temperate area. Um, and the best that you have to work with. So, like Kevin said, uh, just just growing them out year after year, though, and allowing natural selection to play with the, the genetic diversity that you have, because this is really the way to go. Okay. Um, what do you make of the idea of um, causing a shorter maturation window and avoiding the high midsummer temperatures in places like Montana um, that cause flowers to abort before setting seed by transplanting? Mm -hmm. I think it's worth it's worth a shot. We don't have much experience with transplanting, but uh, you know we've tried it with some success just in home gardens and some failures as well. And and the only failure we noticed was it's similar to squash in that you want to get it transplanted as quickly as possible. You don't want it to get root bound at all. If it starts to get root bound, it'll stunt the plant, and it, it's very hard for quinoa to recover well from that. So. 
I think it's worth a worth a shot. It depends on you know what what size you're growing. But you know, in addition to overcoming the problem of heat, transplanting could help get ahead of the weeds as well. If if you do it the right way, you're you get a jump start on on weed suppression or or weed management. So there definitely is some room, I think, for transplanting. A lot of the acreage we're we're looking at here, it, and and the topography here is so steep that we we really can't think much about transplanting here. But I think on smaller to mid-sized farms, it's an excellent option and and worth trying for sure. And yields yields from these transplanted crops might might be quite high. Okay. Um, I just like to add, okay. I, I was in contact with some uh, a farm, and the name of it escapes. But could you talk a little closer to the oh, mic sure. there? Um, because we can't hear you that well. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I was in, uh, last year in contact with some farmers um, in Boistford, which is in the Chehalis Valley of Western Washington, and they, they did transplant on their quinoa crop uh, fairly early on, and they had some good luck with that. Um, so so it, it can be done. I, on the, I don't know how uh, feasible that would be on the large scale, because that, that would be quite a bit of effort, but um, I, I think it's definitely worth a try. Okay. Um Let's see. Um, we have a question, a um, couple questions actually, about the relationships between um, quinoa and lamb's quarters. Um, this one is about whether or not um, lamb's quarters has an equal propensity um, to getting downy mildew, and um, does either plant function as a accelerator to hosting or spreading that to other susceptible crops? Okay, so this is Kevin talking right now. This sounds like a, a hard question, so I'm going to have Adam, my grad student, answer that one. Okay. <laughs> um, so we, we have several uh, species of Kenopodium in, in North America here. One is Kenopodium album, which is a Eurasian inter introduced species. Um, and then we also have a native species, Kenopodium berlandieri. Uh, that one seems to have a high level of immunity to uh, downy mildew. And in fact, it, uh, they, there were some crosses done with uh, Kenopodium Berlin, actually a domesticated version of, of uh, Kenopodium berlandieri that, that's from Mexico, and they introduced uh, uh, resistance into a quinoa variety. Um, as far as Kenopodium album, um, there are reports of downy mildew um, affecting both quinoa and Kenopodium album within a short distance of each other in Denmark, so it seems that that one might be able to host downy mildew. Um, I, I'd also be interested in other species in the Kenopodium genus to see if they can host the disease. Um, downy, downy mildew too, because um, it affects spinach, which is also in the quinopodium family. Um, the strain of downy mildew that affects quinoa is fairly host specific, so it really seems that the, the only possible um, uh, transfer that you could see would be between like lamb's quarter or quinoa, and not, nothing further than saying you, you, I wouldn't worry about a spinach crop with downy mildew infecting quinoa. But uh, that is something that I, I think is definitely going to be a concern and something to uh, keep an eye out for if you're growing um, quinoa, say, near other quinopodium species. Okay. Um, here's a question about whether or not you've tried eating any of the seed that you've grown. Um, this grower says when he grew it, um, he had to do a lot of washing to get them even remotely palatable. Um, he used the brightest, brilliant variety. Um, he said he used a French press, about 10 or 12 rinse cycles or so. Can you talk more about that? Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with a uh, French press. Um, I think for making coffee. Oh, oh, oh I got you. Okay, for coffee. I think I think that's what. It yeah, is. that makes sense then. So yeah, that you know we've done we've done a little bit of that, but it's again we our plots are so small that we save every little bit of seed we can. We usually don't have extra seed to to experiment eating with. Hopefully this next year we will start having extra and we can look into all these post-harvest traits um, and figure out what to do with them but but we haven't had that luxury yet that said we have tried some of us have tried eating our quinoa once or twice um, I've never used a French press so I'm not sure how that works the way I cleaned it when I ate our own quinoa was just rinsing it um, pretty vigorously in my kitchen sink so just on a small scale and just doing that I didn't do it ten times maybe five or six times and and that seemed to work really well I just used my hands and put it in a pot and kept re-rinsing and rinsing but but again that's a really small scale and and very limited sample size of actually doing that um, Adam do you have any experience you want to add 
Um, nothing. I, I, yeah. Okay, so sorry, we're we're not too helpful on that track, okay. but but it is something that's really important, and um, I I mentioned it briefly, and we recently enlisted the help of a WSU food scientist, actually two food scientists, uh, Carolyn Ross and <clears throat> excuse me, Craig Morris, and they are are going to be helping us with a lot of these post-harvest traits. And Carolyn Ross does sensory evaluations, taste evaluations all types of things like this. So we we are going to be doing a lot of selection for taste and nutritional value in our quinoa lines. And so we'll be able to help help you answer that question in the future. But at this point, our seed uh, quantities were just too low to... It, we, uh, we're not to the point of the Vavilov Institute where they starve to save their seed, but we, but we definitely don't eat our seed. But I think Adam has something to add now. Oh, I was just going to add that the Chilean varieties, uh, while they do best, they also do tend to have a smaller seed size than the Bolivian varieties, and they also tend to have a higher saponin concentration. Um, so that's one of the drawbacks to them. Um, but I think by making crosses with the Chilean varieties and with, say, Peruvian and Bolivian varieties, um, we can you know, increase the, the seed size and hopefully um, even bring in a, a saponin-free traits that are, that are found in some... Uh, varieties from Bolivia. So I, th I think that's one potential route to maybe get around uh, the, the saponin issue. But then along with that, if, if that's keeping the birds away and you have a high you know, bird population, that, that might actually not be a, a good way to go. Um, there were some trials done in Cambridge um, in the early 80s for the British chemo program, and they lost a large percentage of some of their plots due to bird pressure, and they actually had to put nets over them. So I think it would really be uh, kind of site specific depending on maybe your bird pressure but uh, okay um here's a question about how long before we see a WSU quinoa variety if you might be able to estimate like 10 years or more or less it, yeah sure we will give you an estimate if it wasn't for our collaboration with Jeff Mon and Rick Jellin at Brigham Young University it probably would be 8 to 10 years um but what Jeff and, and Rick had done in a lot of their genetic research was they made crosses 10, 12, 15 years ago and, and started to grow these out, always inside a greenhouse, so not outside, but, but they grew them out as individual lines. And so that's why we're hoping to have 700 to 800 lines next year. That's why we had 350 this year. And as I mentioned, out of those 350, we do have 15 to 20 that are looking... Um, that are looking really, really good from this first year on the field, and we've included them in our multi-state variety trials, so they'll be grown in Utah, Oregon, and Washington um, on a much larger scale, randomized replicated plots. And if, if they do well for two years in these multi-state trials in, in any of the locations, or especially across, but in any specific location either, even, then we'll be able to release a variety directly after that. So we could be even two to three years away, potentially. Um, that that would be the quickest. And Adam's been making a lot of crosses in the greenhouse, a lot of really interesting great crosses that we're starting to fast track as, as best we can and get them through the process. We're going to be growing those progeny F2 lines out in the field next year, or the 2013, so we'll see how they do. We'll start our selection process on those. And so hopefully just by, you know, working really collaboratively with, with the BYU researchers, we'll be able to get new varieties out to growers, hopefully fairly soon. But that's also the reason I included the, the varieties that are available now. There's some, um, there's some really, really good ones out there, and the private breeders are still going to be going and developing their own varieties through different selection methods and different um, selection environments. So working really closely with them is important as well, and, and just keeping keeping an eye on what they have. Um, it's always exciting to see what new variety Frank Morton is going to be putting out. Okay. Um, is there a couple questions about um, how you can tell if your area is suitable for growing quinoa and what types of soil it does best on? Um, if you could talk a little closer there, Adam. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I think the major uh, limiting factor, just uh, speaking of the U.S. as a whole, is just you know trying to avoid the the high temperatures. 
So if if you don't if you can plant it before and escape high temperatures, then I think you'd have um, a good shot at you know get, getting getting a crop in. But say if you have a very short growing season and you know it gets up into the hundreds, I, I don't know how um, the quinoa varieties we currently have would would perform. So, um, but in many cases, there just there haven't been trials done in many areas. So you know we. We we can only speak from the experiences we have and that others have had at Colorado State. So, um, you know, if, if you know, I, I just encourage people to try small plots of it if you know if they don't have these limiting factors um, that we talked about. Um, as far as soil type, you know, in South America, it's reported and growing in a wide range of soils. Uh, uh, in southern Bolivia, it's grown in pure sand and some very dry areas, and elsewhere, you know, it's grown in some clay soils. Um, there's a study in Denmark that, that seems to show that it affects nitrogen uptake to some extent. So clay soils, it, it did seem to do better on as far as um, utilizing the nitrogen in the soil better. Um, but yeah, that, that and then also it can uh, take a wide range of pHs as well. So it, it, it's it's fairly um, uh, tolerant of a wide range of soil types. Okay. Um, what's a good place to start? Where's a good place to start looking for varieties if you live in an area that's not similar to um, any of the places that you are currently trialing varieties? Yeah, I think the best place to start looking for varieties are through. Well, I would just Google look look Google as much as you can, but look through the list I included in this presentation on all the different seed varieties and seed companies. And even though those might not be from your area, they've typically moved around a lot. So a lot of them are selections out of other varieties that have come from New Mexico, for example, or Colorado, for example, which in turn came directly from Bolivia. So, so with quinoa, each time they're grown in a new place, they'll start adapting to that place if, if the variety is still diverse enough. And I think one of the one of the main drawbacks that we have right now is that there are not there's there's just very little um, very few quinoa varieties sold in the U.S. and what we're hoping over the next few years is to you know maybe get quinoa varieties that do you know get some tests going in the Northeast find out what those are work with small seed companies or or medium sized seed companies in the Northeast and try and get those um, varieties sold through them but at this point it's really I mean that's that's been our major challenge throughout this whole process is finding good seed varieties to even start with, um, and we were really lucky to find a few, but but there's not there's not that much out there. There's a lot more than there used to be though. Um, um, are and, you working? Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I just wanted to mention one other place, but it it only you know will give you very very small amounts, about 200 seeds. And it's the USDA germplasm repository. And if you're able to do some observations and report back to them, oftentimes they'll be able to give you that small amount of seed. And, and you can Google, I, I don't know the website offhand, but if you Google G-R-I-N, GRIN, it's usually the first one to pop up the germplasm repository um, institute or something. And, and then so you can look through there. You can type in quinoa and different quinoa varieties and look for the ones they have available and kind of try and match you know your climate to their descriptors and then and then you can get some that aren't publicly available and at least try them out and see how they do but but that's where we started with our you know we started with exactly that pretty much 44 different germplasm accessions from Grin and only 200 seeds of each, so started very small as well, and that just seems like a good way to go. But again, out of those 44, at least 30 to 32 of them failed. So, you, so if you're going to try using Grin, you you know you want to try more than one or two lines, but um, and and they will ask you for observations and any kind of data you can send them as well to help them with their data collection. Um, one great thing about the GRIN database is it links up the location data with a lot of the varieties. So you can actually Google map them. And what I would encourage you is if, if you're looking through the list of quinoa varieties they have, um, to just make sure that you pick the ones from Chile um, if, if you want to have a good, good chance of it uh, growing in your environment just because uh, you know, those 
growth, the photo or the, the latitudes that we have in the United States. There are also uh, quite a few varieties whose origin is listed as the United States, and these uh, all have Chilean backgrounds, or maybe Chilean uh, altiplano mix, or uh, but uh, those two would, would be worth trying. There's actually a, quite a large group of uh, quinoa varieties that are listed as coming from New Mexico, and those are from Amigdio Bologna, who was a kind of early quinoa pioneer and brought uh, kind of an interesting and, and good group of uh, diverse quinoa varieties. So um, I, th I think that those uh, I'd encourage people to try those out too. But um, but yeah, just just I, growing them out and um, seeing how they do. I think is really the way to go. Grin, Grin is a great resource, and I, I definitely recommend it, um, as well as trying the commercially available varieties. Okay. Have you ever used? Um, have you done any work with um, red or black seeded varieties? Um, most of our varieties are yellow seeded, or, or they're kind of a, a cream color. Um, there's one variety that is from the Bologna group that I mentioned that that's red seeded, and we're growing that out for variety trials. Um, the, we we have found a black seeded variety that um, I, I've made some crosses to just just to test my crossing methods out because black seed is a dominant trait so I, I can kind of uh, determine how successful my crosses are. But um, seed color is a very complex trait and so um, I'm currently seeing how that that those combine together with crosses and I'm seeing like browns and um, all, all sorts of shades of different colors so uh, a few purples as well so. Um, but but yeah, we definitely want to look at different seed colors because there is you know demand for that. Um, yeah, good question. And this this is Kevin again. We have whites and one gold and a few reds that actually did look good enough out of our um, genotyping trials last year, our phenotyping trials that that will be included in the variety trials this year. So if we do release. Um, a variety, there's a good chance it might be red seeded, seeded one in the near future. And, and that also brings up another um, point that I forgot to mention earlier, but you know, lamb's quarter is a big issue with um, growing quinoa and getting the lamb's quarter out. And we've seen so far, uh, at least up here, all the lamb's quarter leaves are green. Whereas with quinoa, we see a lot of, a lot of purples, reds, different colored leaves. And so that's another thing we're also looking at is if we can have quinoa varieties with with bright purple or, or red leaves, it it would help the um, the weeding process early on when when the two plants, uh, lamb's quarter and quinoa, look so similar. It'd be one way to easily get rid of the the lamb's quarter out of the population. So it's not just seeds that are red; it can be the the leaves, the stalk, stems, a, a lot of a lot of parts. It's a beautiful plant in, in many ways. Okay. Um, has any research or knowledge of the crop um, being used in livestock grazing been done? Out here in the rain shadow of the San Juans, this would be a great livestock planting when combined with non-irrigated pasture and management intensive grazing. Uh, this is Adam. Um, I have, there have been a few studies on its use as a forage and um, but one of them is in Dutch, so I, I, but from what I can tell from people quoting the study, um, that it, it did fairly well. Um, the other one, uh, actually that one was in Danish, the, the, the other one in English, it didn't perform particularly well in uh, comparison to a grass clover mix. So that's as far as really I can speak of because we haven't looked at forage here. Um, but also in South America, it, uh, it, it's fed to, to livestock as well. So. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'd give it a try. <laughs> yeah, so this isn't for livestock specifically, but one anecdotal observation we've had is we'll often thin our quinoa and and then go ahead and eat the eat the leaves, and because of all the uh, calcium oxalate crystals on quinoa leaves, it, the the leaves are able to stay fresh or stay green for a lot longer, so there there's potential, you know, to livestock there. But when compared to like chard or kale or lettuce, that's kept in a fridge, you know, that's usually not looking too good after a couple weeks. The quinoa stayed looking really green and fresh for at least six weeks. It might have stayed even longer, but we ran out at that point. Hmm. And I, I'm not sure if that would translate at all to you know, maybe 
being good for forage or um, some time, type of haylage or something for livestock, but it's worth checking into and the studies that have shown lamb's quarter to be, lamb's quarter leaves to be very nutritious um, would probably have some relevance with quinoa as well and, and we'd be guessing the, the quinoa um, leaves and there has been some studies with quinoa as well but that they would, the forage would be would be highly nutritious too. But but we have personal experience we don't have any with that. But great idea and something that would be really, really fun to try. Okay. Um is asynchronous seed ripening a problem? Um it is. Uh to some extent um you know when the seeds uh and, and become mature, you'll notice there are some immature flowers that didn't exactly, you know, self-pollinate all the way. Um, but generally, it, it's you get a good amount of the seed that, that matures at the same time. Um, with, say, a Bolivian or Peruvian variety, though, growing it at our latitude, that's where you see one of the huge problems because while some of them don't really flower or may not reach the flowering point, um, th there are some instances in cool locations where you can have a set seed, but it will will just continue to grow and grow and grow uh, because it, it, it's used to like a 200-day growing season. So um, like, like a, there's a Bolivian and a Peruvian cultivar grown in trials in England, and it grew until November. And they actually got pretty high yields off of it, but they had to harvest the green plants and dry them in the greenhouse. So um, the Chilean varieties are the best for that, um, and, and they generally do uh, the seeds mature at the, the same time. Okay. Um, what are some of the advantages to quinoa versus traditional crops since the yields aren't that high in comparison? Well, the, the yields with the traditional crops didn't start out that high either. So that's why, you know, we're working with breeding right now and trying to get those yields higher. Um, and, and a lot of it isn't just breeding, but just figuring out how to grow it on a, on a good, good scale here. Will will go a long way to improving the yields, but if you want to look at other advantages, price right now is would be an excellent motivation for growing quinoa. Um, it the the price of wheat, barley here fluctuate all the time. Quinoa not as much, but it fluctuates too. But you know, if you look at it at any one snapshot in time, we've we've seen. Um, quinoa prices to be three to four times as high as wheat prices, at, at least out out here. Um, so that's that's one good option. Um, and but another one is really diversifying the market. I mean, a lot a lot of times quinoa or or wheat or barley or whatever traditional crops are grown can saturate a market, and oftentimes being the first one or get developing a relationship with them. Um, a distributor or or a community and big or baker whatever whatever you want to do just developing that relationship being getting in early that that might be a good motivation too but really a lot of growers are interested in it um, for the the fact that it can diversify their cropping rotation and their marketing options those are the uh, the number one reasons we hear but but again it's it's not as easy to grow as we or barley, there you know. There's a couple other steps added. It, it it has a new set of diseases, and you know it's different than wheat, but it's also different than vegetables. It's more like a, a seed crop, like if you're a, a seed grower of beets or spinach or whatever. It's it's a lot more like that. Um, so it, th yeah, it's it's definitely not a oh a magic bullet or anything like that. It, it's it's got a lot of a lot of issues that need to be worked out, but I think the yield issue can be, you know, sustainably worked out within the next several years. We've already seen really good strides as far as that goes. And, and one last point, we're also not breeding for yield at all costs. We're, we are breeding for higher yield, that's true, but we're, we're trying really hard not to lose some of the other traits that quinoa is known for such as nutritional value or taste or anything like that. So, you know, we have multiple objectives with the breeding program, and yield is just one of them. And if we can increase yield with increasing those other traits, that's that's where we really um, 
focus our attention is 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 that that type of um, reading. Okay, we have time for one very last question here before we go. Um, you mentioned that irrigation can help buffer heat stress. Um, does that refer only to overhead irrigation or also drip? It works with drip as well. Um, we actually have not tried it overhead, but we've seen it with drip, and it, it seems to work quite well with drip. We actually prefer drip because of the downy mildew problem. Um, We've worked with other crops where we've started overhead irrigating just to just in test plots to try them out, and where downy mildew wasn't an issue anyway, it just it just blossomed and, and took over. And so, given that downy mildew is a problem with quinoa, we already we don't want to exacerbate that problem with overhead. Um, it might be okay at some times during the, the growing season to do that. The only time we've used overhead on quinoa is before it actually germinates um, or emerges. Other than that, we just stick to drip. Um, but Adam, did you want to add anything? Or? Um, there was one bit I wanted to say about uh, heat issues. And, and uh, I just don't want to give the impression that, that there, there are areas that are necessarily like going to be off limits forever for quinoa. Um, in quinoa's range in South America, there are some areas where it was actually pushed out of where there are actually quite high summer temperatures, um, such as northern Argentina and, and parts of northern Chile. Um, but also an interesting fact is that uh, quinoa had a cousin species um, that was domesticated in the southeastern United States and that was uh, grown uh, actually up until probably 1000 AD. And so there's evidence of this in caves in Arkansas. They find these larger seeds that look like you know, quinoa seeds and that, that show some evidence of domestication. So, I mean, that, that species is gone, but I think it, it shows that uh, a quinopod a uh, crop isn't an impossibility for part, parts of the country, and that really, um, uh, there, there's the genetic diversity is out there. Um, so it may take, I don't know, uh, that it's just kind of a thought I wanted to put out there. Oh, that's interesting. Well, we are running out of time, but I'd like to thank everyone for your questions and mention once again that um, you'll be able to find this presentation as well as our many other recorded presentations on organic farming topics at the link on your screen.